There we go. Can you see that? Yes. Ah, thank you. Um, delighted to be here. I'm looking through the list of attendees and wondering why I'm giving this talk. I think there's a bunch of folks on that list that uh, that should be giving it. Um, this is a drone shot from Comanche in the last transpac. Um, it doesn't always look this way, but the guys are sending it once the drone is out there. So that's why the boat looks suppressed. So uh, this is uh, Kyle Langford uh, operating the drone, and I was astonished that he was able to recover the drone every time it went out. Let's see. Okay, Transpac. The, um, I think of the race in, in five segments. Um, I'll just briefly outline the five segments. Um, let's see. The, uh, if folks have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And then if a question, if Dobbs thinks that a question, we should stop and handle it at the time, Dobbs will uh, interrupt me. But just post them in the chat to everyone. So the Transpac, the five races, the first race, is to get to the synoptic breeze before the glass off in shore. The synoptic breeze, the synoptic stands for the wind that's driven by the synoptic features that you see on a synoptic chart, highs, lows, fronts. It's, for our purposes, it's the wind that blows all night. And so you gotta get to that because as we all know, the wind inshore is gonna uh, glass off. And if you have a Catalina eddy, like the big boats did last year, then it's a very tricky broken field run but you have to get out that first night. And if someone in your class makes it out and you don't, your race is over. Um, once you're into the synoptic breeze and you're off, then you gotta figure out where to go. You pick and race to your, way, your waypoint at the ridge, which is typically around 1.30. Once you're past the ridge, you get lifted and then you're in the slot cars leg. I think I first heard that term from uh, Bruce Nelson years ago. And he was one of the early ones to sort of think about it that way. But you enter your slot and for that middle third of the race, you're for the most part stuck in your slot, although there's some, some flexibility. Once you get out of the slot car's leg, that means it's now the wind is veered enough so that you can jibe. You gotta decide whether to jibe. You gotta decide what corner to go to on the run, the last third of the race. And then of course you gotta be playing the shifts and the squalls and the streets during that run. And then for the approach, you want to sail in the accelerated wind approaching the finish. So those are the five sections of the race that I'll be going through. A refresher on convergent, converging winds. In over land in the northern hemisphere, the wind backs, it shifts to the left. So that means if you're looking at the land, if you're facing the land in the northern hemisphere and the wind is blowing parallel to the shore, you know, from right to left, for example, along Catalina Island, it's okay to go in right to the bricks because there's convergent wind in there and the wind will go in right into the beach or right into the points. And you'll get a little bit of a back. Um, and in the case of Catalina, you'll get less current. So there's nothing not to like. You know, you go in there, you know, you tack onto port, you get the lift, flat water, good breeze, less current, um, it's a good look. In the Northern Hemisphere, if you're facing land and the wind is blowing from the left to the right, there'll be a light zone right along the shore. And of course, you see that on the Palos Verdes coastline. You see it on the south side of Catalina, on the other side of the West End. And you even see it on the North Shore of Molokai. As we'll talk about for the approach, I like to play Molokai because of the accelerated breeze, but if you get in too close, you'll find that light air strip right along the beach. And of course, many of you are familiar with that light air strip along the beach, you know, bringing boats back from Mexico races. That's a situation where the wind is blowing from left to right. And right in there next to the beach, you know, there's that band of light air. So the friction of the land backs the wind. It's in the opposite in the Southern hemisphere. And um, Bernot on Breeze is a great little book by Jean-Yves Bernot about sort of terrain effects of land. It's long out of print, but occasionally you can find it on Amazon. Um, there's other good books. Uh, David Birch has a good book on weather and our own John Jourdain has a good book on weather. And then of course, the Alan Watts books are good. Uh, this is the Catalina Channel. Um, question, 
Can you see my cursor? Can somebody tell me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So the typical, if you have a southwesterly at the start, you know, you'll be starting here at the Point Firm and Bowie, um, and I'll get into more detail in a minute, but typically, if on starboard you can lay the isthmus, off you go on starboard. And then as you cross the channel, you'll get lifted up to somewhere around Howlands or Arrow Point, and then you play the shore. If you can't lay the isthmus on starboard, it typically makes sense to play this shore. You don't want to play it super close because there's light air next to the cliffs and there's kelp in there. But nevertheless, you want to play it close enough so you're out of the current. And then as soon as you can, as soon as it's pretty clear, you can lay the isthmus on starboard, you know, off you go to cross. It typically makes some, it's an error to tack in the center unless you have to, unless there's a, um, you know, Catalina eddy or some other problem. So typically once you head off across the channel, you want to get right on across because of the increased current. And I guess there's DVT out there too now. The, um, and then you play this coast and I'll get into a little more detail. Here's the typical Catalina wind field. Um, one feature that you, have to be aware of is there's the isthmus fan. So this is the westerly that blows through the isthmus and then it fans out from the isthmus. And at the edge of that fan, there's a light air zone. It's semicircular. And that light air zone goes from about Cherry Cove, you know, on around. Um, sometimes that light air zone gets out to about Howlands. So if you could lay the isthmus, if you took off on starboard, but you didn't get that much of a lift, keep your eye out for that isthmus fan and don't sail into it because it's really light. So if you see the isthmus fan, you know, get in pretty close to it because you want to get out of the current, but tack before you get to the isthmus fan, take a port until you can lay arrow point and then come in again. Um, the other thing that you can notice on this wind field, this is an HRRR wind field, is you can notice this light air zone on the far side of the west end of Catalina. And this is a terrible place. Um, you do not want to go there, and many transpacks have been lost right there. This is approaching Catalina. If you're sailing with a crew from out of town, as you approach Catalina, they'll all start talking about, hey, it's light in there, we got a tack. Well, it's flat water in there, and it looks light, but, you know, carry on in and don't tack until unless it actually is getting light. But typically the breeze is pretty good right on into the points. I wouldn't go into the bays and I'd watch out for the one rock, but it's generally good to go right into the points. And if you watch your wind gear, you find that, yeah, while it looks light, it's actually you know good breeze right on into the points and a nice lefty. This is a close up of Catalina. You can see the rock here near the West End. That rock is some years it's covered in kelp, and so it's not a problem. Other years it's not covered in kelp, so you want to, you know, put a waypoint on it and make sure to keep your eyes on it, and not hit that thing. And again, this shoreline here along this edge of the West End pays really well. This shoreline down here is absolute death, so you absolutely want to avoid tacking right at the West End and getting sucked down into there. And then the isthmus fan typically blows right about in here. So kind of from Cherry Cove on around, and it's almost a perfect semicircle. So summary for Catalina, if you can't lay the isthmus on starboard, tack loosely up the Palos Verde shoreline. Um, but again, you want to play that loose because it's light air in there close and there's kelp in there close. Don't tack to port in mid-channel. It prolongs your time in the adverse current. If you're heading across the Catalina Channel and you're in a group of one design boats, and many of you have had this experience, you'll discover that the, the boat that's on the lee bow of the fleet um, it appears to get carried up in front of the boats on her weather hip as she gets close to the island. And she's not actually getting carried up. What's happening is she's getting out of the current and the fleet behind her is, getting, is continuing to get set down behind her. But nevertheless, the appearance is that the first boat to Catalina gets carried up in front of the boats that are on her weather hip. 
She's the first one to the header and the first one to the more breeze. She tacks in the header onto port and she's off and crosses the fleet. So in summary, if you're in a fleet of boats, um, you wanna be that boat that's on the lee bow of the, of the clump of boats. And if you don't have a fleet of boats, if you're by yourself, the takeaway is you wanna lean on it a little bit in mid channel. You meaning you don't wanna be sailing you know, absolutely on your upwind VMG angles. You wanna just be leaning on the boat a tip and just you know, head on across. But just a tick of leaning is what you want. Don't get sucked into the isthmus fan. If you're coming in down there, tack just before the fan. West of Arrow Point, play the points. Um, stay outside the kelp, don't hit the rock. And then there's divergent wind on the south side of Catalina. So when you get to the west end, and you don't have to go in really close to the west end itself, but in any event, when you get to the west end, delay your tack onto starboard at the west end until the wind freshens and has filled in a beam to port. And that's typically you know, good 15 minutes. If you're on starboard, if you have tacked and you're on starboard and it's getting lighter and you're getting headed, tack back to port immediately. And if you don't tack back immediately, then it'll get harder and harder to tack as you see the boats up on your you know, weather hip, you know, getting lifted and moving away. And it'll take real strength of character to tack back you know, once you've lost the fleet. So it's really important not to tack too soon to starboard. If, you're from, if you have crew from out of town, they'll be panicked when you're on port because they're gonna assume that if you tack on starboard, you're pointing at Hawaii and that on port you're heading for Alaska. And so the way to settle them down is to um, point out to them that when you're there at the West End, Hawaii is actually dead upwind because the wind you're probably in is about a 245 magnetic, which is the same as the Great Circle to Hawaii. So port tack at the West End of Catalina is not very expensive. It's just folks from who haven't done the race before have this um, misunderstanding that you're sailing at 90 degrees to uh, the course. And in fact, you're not, it's an even split. So it is, um, it is cheap to do port and it's really expensive to tack too soon. Um, getting headed down into that divergent area south of the West End is fatal. So nothing else matters the first day except getting into that synoptic breeze. Um, you gotta know where it is. Um, in the old days, I used to charter an airplane and go out and fly around the night before the race just to see where the edge of the wind was. Um, it turns out that uh, Roy Disney 737 was not the right boat to do that in. It was far better to do it in a small plane. But in any event, it's no longer necessary to do that. Nowadays, the HRRR nails it. So you just got to be sure to um, you know, get the right models, take a look at it. But you have to know where that synoptic breeze is. In many years, it's a cakewalk. You're just gonna sail out past Catalina, you're in the westerly and you're off. But some years, like last year for the big boats, it's just a major mission to get to the synoptic breeze. If you do have a Catalina eddy, and you know, all, you all know what that's like, it's June gloom, it's the overcast, you know, you're in a southeasterly, you have to sail smart to get to the synoptic breeze. And there's a lot of options. Some years it makes sense to go up by Santa Rosa. One year it actually made sense to go north of the Channel Islands through the Santa Barbara Channel. Um, some years it makes sense to go between San Nick and San Clemente. So it, it just varies, but you have to know where to go. The years with the Catalina Eddy, interestingly, they're often really windy off in the synoptic breeze because it's those windy westerlies blowing outside that spin the eddy up and put that energy into the eddy. Um, if you have a Catalina eddy, take it super seriously. You wanna download hourly high resolution HRRR um, predictions. That can be expensive, but you know, it's worth it. You wanna calibrate those HRRR forecasts against the sky and against the local wind direction. The, just like any forecast, they're not perfect, but nevertheless, you can look at the HRRR, you can see what the pattern is, and then you can kind of calibrate it to what you see. But every eddy is different. There's no rules of thumb. Some eddies are super complicated, like last Transpac, where there was five different you know, centers of circulation in a hundred mile area. Um, 
And then you want to, if you have an eddy, you got to concentrate. It's really easy to lose the race that first afternoon in the eddy. And this is the one of the hardest things for a navigator is to get the eddy figured out. But fortunately, you only have to deal with that like one, one race in three or four. Here's an example of an eddy. Um, I'm hoping you can see my cursor, but there's Catalina Island. In this case, if you look at it, you'd say, well, it's probably best to go out north of San Nick. Because if you go out south of San Nick, it's just a lot lighter air down here off of the West End. So going out north of San Nick, in general, you're just going to get a big veer. So you're going to just play that veer and then head on out. Here's another eddy. This is uh, HRRR. My cursor, that shows Catalina. There's San Nick there. This one is a really tough situation. There's no solution here. You've just got light air all the way across. So in this situation, what you'd have to do is you'd have to go forward in time and look to see where this thing is gonna break. But this one snapshot doesn't show an answer other than a very rare circumstance of going out through the, the uh, Santa Barbara Channel, you know, north of the Channel Islands. To my knowledge, that only worked once where a Cal 40 actually went out there and took off and everybody else spent the night in here. Um, but that's a very, very expensive um, tactic to take. So you'd only want to do that if it were you know, very clear cut. I've never personally had to do that, although I have come out you know, way north, just, you know, just south of Santa Rosa. I've never gone north of the Channel Islands, but it did work one year. So in this situation, what you'd have to do is play it forward and back figure out where it's going to break first you know see if you can find a tongue of wind to get across this thing but if it if this were fairly stable this might be a situation where it paid to go out and of course last year there was you know boats that were heading up there considering that not when i say last year i mean last race um here's another hrrr um here's a complicated eddy there's a rotation here in this case it's pretty clear that there's a path here out that's north of San Nick and that you'd basically just um, you know, sail the shifts and then head out past Santa Barbara Island and north of San Nick to get there. And these, these are overly simplified because these are just one snapshot, but the eddy moves around. And so you have to, you have to take that into account. This is last Transpac, and I'll let this play a couple of times while I talk about it, and then I'm going to post all of these slides on my website. So if people want to download the slides from the website, they'll be able to play this themselves. But this is an overlay of three sets of data. Um, the red symbols are the actual boats that first day, and this is the last start. You'll recognize the boat names as, the, as it plays on. And then it's overlaid with the aerial, the high resolution aerial imagery. So you can see the cloud patterns. And then the wind arrows are coming from the HRRR. And in this case, these are the HRRR files that I downloaded and captured um, on Comanche um, at the last transpack. And so, and then this particular eddy from last year is one of the most complicated ones that I can recall, but there were times during that eddy when there was five different circulations. And um, I went through this one with Joe Sinkowitz from NOAA and he was stunned. I mean, he knew about the Catalina eddy, but he was just astonished to discover that there's times during this eddy where there's literally five different circulations in an area that's like 150 miles square. It's just an extraordinarily complicated set of weather. And the other thing about it is that it's, it's not the same, you know, from one eddy to the next. It's different. So there's no rules of thumb. You just have to figure it out and, and do the best you can. And the best way to figure it out is the HRRR data. It's not perfect, like I said, but generally it's good enough so that you can look at the sky, look at the wind direction you're in and kind of figure out what's going on based on kind of the overall characterization from the HRRR and then calibrating it against what you see. Um, so you can see, let's, so here you can see the boats. Let's just kind of talk it through. Okay, there's the start. 
boats heading out. Maserati is heading there for the channel. Very challenging there by the West End. Rio and Comanche make it away, this barely. The sleds get stuck. Interestingly, the sleds on the southern edge um, make it out first. Um, piwak has got a bit of a challenge there to the north. And then the boats, you know, Merlin and those boats heading down to the south, you know, they're away. So if uh, folks are interested in looking at this at more length, it'll again be posted on my website with the rest of the slides. Uh, Lance Burke did this overlay and it was, he's done some other fascinating overlays and then maybe I'll post some of them on my website as too, but he took the entire month of July for the entire Pacific last year. It's a huge file and overlaid that against the, uh, the OPC weather maps. And it's a very interesting one to page through. Um, HRRR is free to use. Um, you can download it legally through Expedition, through SailDocs because it's free. Um, these are the strings you can send no matter what software you use. But in any, in any email program, if you send an email to query at saildocs.com and you send those strings, that top string will give you an HRRR grib file. It's about 30 kilobytes, so it's very manageable with uh, Iridium. That second string will give you an HRRR file that's two megabytes, so very high resolution like the ones you just saw. Um, so that's practical if you're using, you know, Inmarsat. It's also practical, of course, if you're still within cell range. The, um, the HRRR updates hourly. You want to check before the start, but it's typically updating about 35 minutes after the hour. Um, the first couple, like any mesoscale forecast, the first hour or two is the best. So don't get, don't get your heart set on using an old HRRR. The big advantage of HRRR is that it updates every hour, you know, whereas some of the other mesoscale models um, only update every six hours, or in some cases, every 12 hours, in the case of predict wind. But the HRRR updates hourly, so be sure to get recent ones. Um, and if you're in a situation like last transpac, where you're just doing, it's just a life or death battle with the, um, with the Eddy, you want to be downloaded, you want to pay the money to download the high resolution HRRR every hour, you know, promptly, and then just do your best. But you can fine tune the coverage, depending on what kind of uh, telemetry system that you have. Odds and ends on the first day, um, bottom fast kelp, I've never seen it in water deeper than 200 feet. So, you know, don't go closer than 200 feet to San Nicolas because um, it's a drag to run into the bottom fast kelp. There are always patches of kelp that have broken loose and are no longer bottom fast. And of course you can run into them anywhere. Um, so do a first, a complete kelp check the first evening before it gets dark and then do a complete kelp check, of course, the next morning as soon as it gets light. On um, some boats, it's possible to do a kelp check with uh, external light, but on most boats, we're kind of stuck with daylight. When you get to the synoptic breeze, you can tell. Um, you'll smell it. It'll start to lift. It'll start to build. It'll get more humid. It'll cool off. And it smells kind of like the beach in Oregon. Um, but it's absolutely no question about it when you find it. That's the slot car's leg. Um, again, thanks to Nelson, I think, for the uh, terminology. But you picked your you picked your waypoint at the ridge, which typically is around 1:30. Um, you you carry on. At some point, the wind lifts, and you're sailing along, you know, just somewhat faster than your downwind VMG angles. And that's when you enter the slot car's leg. And then basically, you sail along. And if you get it right, you're sailing along at just faster than your downwind VMG angles, a sort of ocean downwind angles. And the slot car leg ends when you're lifted far enough so that you can jibe to port. So the slot car leg is over when you have basically an even split, and then you have to decide where to go from there. So typically the slot car's leg is from 130 to 145. Picking the waypoint on the ridge, assuming you survived getting out, and you didn't get stuck on the far side of Catalina and you didn't get stuck in the eddy. Um, this is 
probably the most important decision of the entire race. If you're too far north, you know, at, at about 1.30, you're gonna run out of wind before you get the big enough veer to jibe. So you run out of breeze before you're lifted enough to jibe. So then you have two horrible choices. One is you jibe to port on a horrible angle to avoid getting becalmed. Um, the other one is you don't jibe to port and then you get becalmed. So there's just no good way to solve, to get out of that mistake. Um, if on the other hand, you cross the ridge too far south, it's not quite as embarrassing as the navigator, but you've sailed extra miles needlessly. The boats north of you, they get to the shift first. They jibe out and they cross in front of you on port. So you can't win the race sailing too far south, but it's not, it's not as embarrassing as sailing too far north. But to win the race, you have to get it right. So you pick the ridge waypoint based on the expected strength and the location of the high when you're in that slot car leg, basically between 130 and 145. So you look at the high, where the high is projected to be when you're out there at that part of the race. You use the upper level charts, the grid files, um, the OPC chart. The router will always take you too far north and it's critical to understand why. And this isn't a mistake in the router. The mathematics is perfect in Adrena and an expedition. And it's not a mistake in the weather. Um, the grid files are accurate and you can convince yourself of that on the way back from Hawaii. You know, if you choose to deliver a boat right through the high, you'll realize that the GFS does a very nice job of you know, forecasting the high. So why does the router take you too far north? Well, it'd be like if your job was to um, jog around a swimming pool. You know the fastest path around that swimming pool is with your feet you know, right at the very edge of the pool. Well, you also know that's not gonna work because you know, you're gonna be a little sloppy and eventually you'll fall in. And that's basically why the router takes you too far north. The router assumes the weather is absolutely steady and perfect, and it assumes the boat sails on its polars absolutely perfect. Whereas as a practical matter, what happens is the weather on average is, is accurate, but you get light spots. Every time you get a light spot, you know, the crew has to sail higher. Every time the spinnaker collapses, the crew has to sail higher. Every time a, you know, the boat gets slow, the crew has to sail higher. Every time you sail higher, the wind gets a little lighter, and then when the wind gets lighter, you got to sail higher still, and pretty soon you've spun off into the high. So the router, the calculation is accurate. It just takes you right on the hairy edge, and you can't sail there. You have to have some margin. So the router course, you know, absolutely run a route, but that's basically the edge of death. The router is useful to identify the north edge of any reasonable possible course, but you need some leeway there. The perfect ridge waypoint lets you sail hot of inshore VMG angles until the jibes are even. So this is, um, you know, in the old days, the folks would call it, you know, wallying, you know, even back in the, I mean, you're basically heating it up um, to the lift, in which case, at which point you're gonna jibe. But you don't wanna be, you don't wanna, be sailing your downwind VMG angles, you want to be sailing your ocean VMG angles. So you want to be kind of A3 angles, you know, kind of heating, blasting along out there um, with the confidence that you're going to get that lift and be able to jibe before you run out of breeze. Um, study the French and the Volvo sailors, um, they get this right. The, um, and it's interesting, sailing around a high is the hardest thing for a navigator. And it's why, frankly, the Transpac navigators have done well in the Volvo, because in the Volvo race, you have four highs you got to go around. And, you know, Rudiger was good at it. I got pretty good at it. But it's, um, it's the most difficult thing for a navigator, because if you get it wrong, there's no saving it. You know, you're just screwed. Um, and again, for the Volvo race, it happens four times you know, down the Atlantic and then two more times back up the Atlantic. So it's a, it's a critical thing. If your slot ended up too far north, um, either because you made a mistake or maybe the weather changed, then you have to fight south, you know, sailing your absolute downwind inshore VMG angles, you know, carrying your A2 if you have it, sailing the best ports, 
even if they're somewhat unfavored, but it's expensive to fight south, but you can fight south and you can change lanes to the south. It's just, you can't do it for free. It's gonna cost you. 500 millibar charts um, by Chesnow's book. Um, there's only a small part of it that's all that relevant, but it's still worth supporting Lee. If there's an omega block and you have meridional upper level flow, the surface winds behave as if there's a strong surface high, even if the surface high looks dicey in a given surface chart. If there's zonal flow, meaning the upper level winds are blowing you know, straight east-west, even if the surface maps appear to show a strong surface high, don't trust it. You need some insurance, you need to pick a more southerly ridge crossing because the surface chart will just snap back into a situation where the the high you know, looks um, very spread out, you know, east-west and along a sausage. So the upper level charts, you know, they're worth looking at um, and it's worth understanding how to read them. Um, but frankly, the surface progs and the surface group files are getting good enough so that if you're not familiar with the 500 millibar charts, I wouldn't lose that much sleep about it. But it's, um, if you wanna do everything right, it's worth the trouble to figure them out. So you race in your slot to the shift. You picked your waypoint at about 1.30. Um, you entered the slot and you're off. As I said, if you got your slot perfect, it'll give you the confidence to sail ocean down wind angles, meaning you're sailing fast to VMG and you're sailing hot to the lift. If you're too far north, then you've got to try to get to the, try to change lanes to the left. So you're sailing your inshore downwind VMG angles, you're using your A2 or whatever you've got. You're willing to jibe aggressively to sail on slightly unfavored ports to get, to get south. And you've got to decide how much to pay. Um, even if you're on the perfect slot, you still want to jibe on the big shifts during the slot car legs. So if you get squalls and big shifts, you know, you still want to jibe on them. You never want to sail on the unfavored jibe. But nevertheless, for the most part, when you're in the steadier conditions, you're going to be stuck on starboard. It's expensive to change lanes to the left, but it's more expensive not to do it if you should. And the 99 was a good example. The whole fleet um, ended up north of where we should have. The weather forecasts weren't as good back then as they are now. And then suddenly it became clear that the high was becoming unwell and that we were all too far north. And on Piwacket, it was just a major project to get the boat to you know, change lanes to the left. But the crew was very supportive. And so we just tortured the boat to the south, just sailing as deep as we could, jibing on some relatively ugly angles and just fighting and fighting and fighting to get to the left. And I think we were losing about five miles a day um, to a silver bullet, which was off to the right of us. But nevertheless, you know, the crew was working with me and we just kept fighting. And finally, Robbie started to lose his patience and said, you know, this is crazy. We're just giving away all these miles. And to get one more day, I bet Robbie a, uh, a bottle of 16 year old Lagavulin to see if, and I bet that we would gain 30 miles on uh, silver bullet the next day. And Robbie thought that was such an outlandish bet. He let me do it one more day. And sure enough, the next day, um, Silver Bullet ran out of the breeze. They were 60 miles to the north of us that next day. And then, um, and eventually Robbie actually paid the bet, but that's another story in itself. Okay, this is a chart that's worth looking at. It's a little bit complicated. Um, the center column, shows the data that you can't use during the transpac, during the race, because it's only available for a fee. Um, and then the, the middle row is the mesoscale data and the bottom row is the global data. The right-hand column is data that you can use during the transpac because you can get it for free. And then again, this is mesoscale and this is global. So briefly, the data you can't use. So you can, of course you can use it before the prep signal, but you can't use it during the race. So if you have a paid account with sail flow, you can't use that during the race. Something to be really careful of is the Point Vicente 
observation. It's a very useful observation. And, you know, if, if after the race starts, one of your crewmen, you know, is looking at his phone and says, oh, the wind is, the wind is filling in at Point Vicente, well, you just cheated. And the reason is the Point Vicente is not available on free sail flow. It's only available through the subscription sail flow. So you can't use that during the race. The Transpac uses a very literal interpretation of Racing Rule 41 and Case 120. So you have to stick to only free data. That you can use sail flow, the free version, but you can't get you know, Point Vicente on the free version. Um, HRRR is available from the paid version of SailFlow, so don't get it there. Instead, get your HRRR through a free source like the NOAA Ready site or like SailDocs. Uh, predict wind, the PWE and the PWG, those are good mesoscale models, but they're not legal to use in the Transpac because you have to pay for them. And frankly, in the Transpac, because it's a US coastal race, the HRRR is preferable because it updates every hour, whereas the predict wind mesoscale models update every 12 hours. So you want to use the HRR for the Transpac. Um, globally, um, satellite imagery, if you have lots of money to spend on satellite communications, the, the high quality satellite imagery, the infrared images um, that you can loop are hugely valuable if you're navigating a big trimaran or something and you're worried about convection. But none of that is legal on the Transpac because the only way to get the high resolution satellite imagery is to pay for it. And similarly, the ECMWF, unless you can find a free source, it's illegal to use. The stuff that is legal is you can use the HRRR from a free source like SailDocs or from the NOAA Ready site. Um, NAM is great for the approach to Hawaii because the NAM will give you um, really good wind angles as you approach Hawaii, you know, to pick ley lines. But, and there's no buoys that are in the right spot. So NAM is a terrific choice for your approach. Um, sail flow, you can use the free account. Um, the NOAA Ready site is free, so you can use that. The weather radar, as long as you're on a free site, you're good. The expedition wharfs, are free and so in principle they're legal but they're not really they're not useful for transpac because nick is um, certainly aware of the hrrr and so he doesn't bother running expedition warps in the uh, in places where the hrr is available um, global model the gfs is widely available six hour updates um, it's free it's legal it got it got better with the finite volume cubed approach improvement a year ago, and I think it's I think it's getting better with the V16. Um, occasionally, you can find the ECMWF available for free publicly, like for Transpac 2017. We all used it for free, and it was great. But um, the access must be free, and it must be public. And I at this time I don't know of a free public access for ECMWF for this year. But it does happen from time to time. Communications trade-offs and observations. Um, after the prep signal, only use free public data. Don't cheat. It is legal to pay for communications, but you can't pay for data. Iridium, if you bake it all down, it costs you $70 a megabyte, unless you have a go unlimited plan. Iridium, the rate is about 2.4 kilobits per second. Um, but the handset is oddly a little faster than the Go, which is a bit of a surprise. And the handset is also helpful if you want to get off the boat and get into a life raft or something, um, the, especially the extreme, which is waterproof. Um, so that's kind of my preference is to use the handset, but the Go is a little easier to use. Um, 30 kilobyte grip files are very practical on Iridium. 60 kilobyte grip files work with some effort. 100 kilobyte grip files are a mission because it's just hard to um, transfer files of that size. I use SailMail. I don't use it with a sideband, but I use SailMail and I set up an account and I set up a subscription for Gribs. And then I take advantage of the fact that SailMail dedicates a route so that uh, Iridium isn't distracted by other um, tasks on the computer trying to run IP. 
And then sail mail doesn't set superseded GRIBs. It doesn't send superseded GRIBs. So what I do, even if I'm navigating on a maxi with an Inmarsat, is I'll set up subscriptions for HRRR and GFS. And then during that day in the transpac, when you can't use Inmarsat because the satellite is blocked, then Iridium is really easy to use because every time I connect, I just get the perfect GRIB file and it just downloads and I don't have to order it and I don't have to worry about getting an old one. It's just, you know, during that part of the race where you can't see Inmarsat, you connect to sail mail and, you know, it immediately downloads just the right um, GRIB file and you never download an old one. So Iridium always works. You can always see around your carbon sales. Um, Inmarsat is 15 bucks a megabyte. It's way faster, 150 kilobits per second. It's the right answer, 11 inch diameter dome. But there's only one satellite per region and that satellite can be blocked by carbon sales. And so for about a day during a typical transpac, if you have carbon sales, you have to use Iridium. And then the KVH V3 is a very attractive system, but it doesn't really work very well for the transpac because the satellite, there's only one satellite for the transpac and it's in exactly the wrong spot. But this KVH is great for Mexico races and all other races. Um, Glasswire is a free firewall program, and it's it's the easiest way I found to block all undesirable internet tasks on your PC, so that um, your communications doesn't get slowed down by the fact that when you connect a uh, Windows PC to the internet, all kinds of things wake up and try to call home. And the Glasswire program is free and really easy to block all that stuff. Uh, but again, on Iridium, SailMail takes care of that for you. Uh, Stan, this is Dobbs. Uh, yeah. If you don't mind, uh, Peter Eisler points out in our chat window, high-res SAT data is freely available. It's like uh, HRR, like the HRR example, uh, just don't get the SAT data from Squid, which is a subscription service. Yep, that's exactly right. If um, yeah. if you have a good source of it, but you also need to, um, I mean, the squid thing is nice because it's the overlay is easy. Um, for H for high res data to be really useful, you have to have a you know clean and quick way to to um, overlay it. Um, but yeah, I agree. If it, if you can get it for free, as long as you're not paying for it, it's great. And the infrared stuff is particularly helpful. Uh, thank okay. you, Peter, for that. Um, uh, there's a couple of other questions uh, before you talk about cutoffs. Uh, uh, let's see here. How do you set up a subscription for Gribs via sale mail? Um, that we should do that offline. That's all documented in the sale mail documentation. But basically, you go through the airmail okay. program and then you set up the subscription, and you have to have a membership in sale mail to do it. Um, but basically you set it up and you tell it the coverage area you want, the frequency you want. Um, and then the sail mail service will do a nice job of deleting any grib file that's been superseded by a subsequent one. So that when you do connect, you just get the most recent one. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another question here. Uh, if you're a beta tester for Starlink, and if you think that it'll be important for Transpac. Um, Starlink will be tricky. Um, it, the, for this year, I think the latitude will be too far south to, to work very well. But there will come a time when, when the satellites all have the laser communications between satellites and it works on the high seas. But right now, the Starlink satellites, they're just using a bent, bent pipe topology where you can only get Starlink coverage when you can see a satellite that can also see a land station. And so Starlink will have some of the disadvantages that Global Star has where it only works along the coast. But what Starlink is intending to do is to have inter-satellite laser communications, which is cool because it's space lasers. Um, and when that happens, then at some point, Starlink will have you know, terrific um, coverage in the high seas, but I don't think it's gonna work for this year. 
Okay, uh, one more question related to, to what works and what doesn't. Greg Dorn asked, uh, is uh, KVH, KVH V3 not work at all or is it intermittent throughout the race? It depends on your sales. If you have carbon sales, it's gonna be frustrating because the, and it's easy to figure this out, but you can look at the KVH data, you can see where their only satellite is that provides coverage for the transpac race. And then you can realize that it's pretty much right where you're headed. So you're gonna be trying to look through your, your mainsail and it's actually low enough so that it's a problem. The, um, that's not a architectural problem, meaning at some point KVH will, you know, they got lots of different satellite contracts. They'll add another one and that problem will go away. But for now, for this transpac, the V3 is not, is not a real attractive choice. Um, the V3 worked great on Mexico races where Inmarsat is quite frustrating if you have carbon sales. So on a, for Inmarsat for the transpac, as you all know, you kind of, on most boats, you kind of have a one day period before the satellite, you know, kind of comes behind the mainsail and then you can, then it works fine again. So for this transpac, I think your choices are in Marsat and then during that one day, you can't get it. You have to use Iridium. Okay. Copy that. Thank you. I think, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a mention here in our chat window of, of, uh, just for those that wanted to get sale mail, just go to salemail.com. Um, but uh, I think that's it for now. Thank you, Stan. Okay, cutoffs. Know your lows, they come in three varieties. There's the extra tropicals, which we all know and love. They're the ones that you see in the winter that have cold fronts and warm fronts and that are moving um, around the world from west to east. There's the cutoffs, which just sit still and spin. And then there's the tropicals, which are the hurricanes and the tropical waves and storms that are down in the tropics. And they move around the world from east to west. Um, be on the lookout for a cutoff, a subtropical low south of the Pacific high. Um, and in the Hawaii race, they're not dangerous, but they do have a huge effect on your tactics. If you can get, if there's a little cutoff there and you can get to the north of it, that's great because there's good breeze to the north of a cutoff and you can go really close to them on the northern side. If you can't get north of a cutoff, then be aware of the light air on the south side of a cutoff and see if you can get you know, further away if you have to pass to the south of it. Um, Transpac cutoffs are not dangerous. They're not going to kill you. They might ruin your race. But I'm going to mention here just as a, because there's a lot of navigators, um, overall subtropicals, these cutoffs are the most dangerous storms to yachting. So it's really important that we all know how to um, keep track of them. So understand them for good seamanship. But the, the Halloween storm, the perfect storm of the movie where the fishing boat sank, that was a cutoff. The Fastnet 79 where 19 sailors drowned was a cutoff. Hobart 98, six sailors drowned, that was a cutoff. And cutoffs are bad if they're comma shaped, if the top is blown off by the jet stream, if they have a big temperature gradient on the poleward side, or if they're new and they have a tight core. And sometimes the meteorologists um, call them a bomb if they're going to intensify very quickly. So you won't run across any of that in the transpac. The transpac cutoffs are super important because they can ruin your race. But um, as navigators, it's really important to be good at cutoffs because they can also kill you in other races. Uh, I'm not sure if this is relevant, Stan, but uh, I had a, also a question from, uh, from Roy uh, about uh, squall strategies. Um, and, and I know that many probably know what these are conventionally, but of course, uh, Roy's concerned about uh, what happens when your boat's so fast and it, and it travels, you know, at a much faster rate of speed than the squall travels. Are there, are there any particular strategies that you think about? Yeah, I'll get to that. That's actually later on in the okay. talk. So here's a couple of weather maps that shows the cutoff. Um, both of, certainly the one on the left, you can't get north of it in the Hawaii race. And that one has a closed um, isobar around it. You don't often get a closed isobar. The one in the right, um, there's also a cutoff, but all you have is a kink in that 1024 isobar. Um, in both cases, you can see that there's you know light air to the south of it. Um, but often cutoffs that affect the uh, 
transpac, you'll just see them as kind of a you know, kink in the isobar and sort of a light zone in the, uh, in the wind barbs. Um, here's a cutoff that's unusual in my experience in that they have actually drawn fronts on it. Um, most, a lot of cutoffs, you don't see the fronts. You can kind of tell it's a cutoff because of where it is and because it's not moving. Um, it's not in the normal you know, westerly flow. Rules of thumb, um, never trust rules of thumb. That's the most important thing, but people are always asking me for rules of thumb. So, you know, kind of here are some, but again, don't believe them. Uh, typically seven to eight millibars from the center of the high or from the ridge at the your closest point during the slot car's leg is a safe bet. If the high is building and it's got a omega block or some other kind of a blocked and it's got meridional flow, you can get closer to the high, six millibars is okay. If the high is fading, or if there's a extra tropical low passing north of the high, if you have zonal upper level flow, if the high is turned into a sausage oriented east west, or if it's splitting, then you gotta be more conservative and you wanna be at least eight millibars at the closest point if you can get there. Um, generally, you cross 130 at, you know, between 27 and 30. You know, 27 for kind of a normal medium light year, 30 for uh, 30 is right at the uh, run line. So 30 would be with a strong high that's really far north. Um, 26 is an extreme and very expensive waypoint at 130, but I've done it occasionally and had it, um, had it work and win the race um, if the high is in very bad shape. Um, old timers used to have rules of thumb. They used to sail through point reliable and point most, and, but they were in heavy boats with lousy forecasts. And even then, it was easy to beat those guys by doing hand routing on Morse code, fleet code maps. So again, the rules of thumb, you know, I don't recommend taking that approach, much better to figure it out. What if the high goes bad? Um, so the way the high goes bad is it turns into an east-west ridge it sags to the south. This is often triggered by an extra tropical low moving from the west to the east north of the high. Um, sometimes the high splits into two. So what you have to do is you gotta decide whether you can get south of the ridge as it slides south and whether you can stay on the trades that will live south of the remaining ridge, meaning there'll always be trades down there if you go far enough down. If you can get below, stay below the ridge and stay on the trades, then you got to do whatever it takes to get there. And sometimes you got to sail an extreme course. And we did that in Drifter in 79. I remember waking up the owner and telling him we had to jibe early onto port and we'd have to sail for a day and a half. And we sailed a really long course, but we did manage to stay on the trades. Um, Merlin got caught in the uh, ridge and I think they spent a day drifting and we beat Merlin by about a day. Um, I don't think Gary Wiseman's ever forgiven me for that year. The, um, if you can't stay on the trades as they move south, then you have to consider the fact that the new trades, astonishingly, will fill in from the northwest. The trades rarely fill in from the south. They don't come back up. A new set of trades comes from the northwest. So in that situation, if you can't, if you can't stay below the, the ridge as it sags to the south, it makes sense to stay above the old ridge, beating in the light westerlies, but still sailing. And then you're the first one to get to the new trades. Um, and then this is what uh, Ben Sr., uh, Benny Mitchell's father did um, in that 79 race. I was first to finish on Drifter because we managed to stay south, but um, Ben Sr. was sail navigating a smaller boat and he figured out um, where the trades were going to fill in from and he stayed north of the ridge and he won the race from up there. Here's a couple of examples. This is a um, this is kind of what happens. Uh, a low is moving across north of the high. It forces the high to the south and in some cases it splits the high. And this is these are the races where you're going to sail the more southerly approach. This is a very old conic projection weather map. This is from the 79 race. And here you can see, you know, the high, and this is a big ridge, you know, 
basically a tongue, the dong, as they called it in those days, of the high. And this is moving south, you know, sagging to the south. This is solid line is the great circle. The rum line actually goes through about here because this is a conic projection. But you can see the, um, the ridge of the high is down around you know, 28, 20, 28 or so um, north at 130. And so this was a year that I think we were the only boat on Drifter to stay south of it. But you know, real early on, we jibed, um, went on to port, and just basically sailed perpendicular to the course to get south of it. But we never got becalmed. We managed to get down into the trades and then stayed in the trades and then came, you know, came at Hawaii from essentially due east of it. And then a bunch of boats, you know, they may still be there, but a bunch of boats got becalmed in this, the center of this ridge. And then Ben Sr., um, he figured it out that, you know, what you want to do is you want to be beating in this westerly because at least you have breeze and you're underway. And the interesting thing that happens is as this high moves in, these are the trade winds. And so the trade winds fill in from the north. So, um, so if you, if the high goes bad, you either have to stay south of it, but if you can't stay south of the ridge, then you want to sail in the westerlies and the trades are going to fill in from the north. Um, this is a very difficult situation. And I think your only hope really is to um, be very open-minded and then to trust the GFS. What else are you going to do? Uh, the trade wind run. So you've been lifted. You now have the ability to sail on either pole, to sail on either jibe. Um, and so you got one thing you got to decide is you got to you know, decide what corner you're going to hit. But then you also want to sail, you want to hit the shifts. You want to sail well during the last third of the race while you're in this run. So late at night, after midnight, you get these dipole squalls. They have a long life to them because their updraft and their downdraft are separated. So these things can go for hours. In the afternoon, you have pop-up squalls. And the pop-up squalls, they're the ones you're more familiar with because they happen in the late afternoon. But you get you know, hot water. You get a very quickly forming squall due to the updraft. But then at some point, it starts to condense. And you get the downdraft. You get good breeze in front of it. And then it commits suicide. The squall kills itself because it creates a cool pool of air right underneath it which seals off the updraft, and then the squall vanishes. And you've seen these in the afternoon. It looks like this big towering squall, and then you look back, and it's gone. Um, but that's very different than the nighttime dipole squalls that can last for hours. In the daytime, you can have streets of clouds. Um, you want to try to avoid sailing in the, the clear sky. Sail in clouds when you can. There's daily wind shifts, and this happens everywhere in the world, but there's kind of a happy hour lefty just around the time of sunset. It, the wind picks up and it goes left a little bit. And that's, you just kind of want to keep that in mind on your ley lines. Um, so you play all of this stuff, but then you get back to the appropriate pole to get to the chosen, when I say pole, it's old school. You want to get back to the appropriate jibe to get to the chosen corner. Some races, um, you got to jibe 50 times. Even the race I did um, single-handed, I think I jibed 45 times. So you um, sometimes it's hard work. The squalls, post-midnight dipole squalls, because they have a separate updraft, they can last for a long time. They self-propagate. Um, they have, because the updraft in front of them, the wind tows in in front of them. So if you're on a boat that, has the right speed to stay in front of one, kind of like a sled or a TP-52, you can jibe back and forth in front of them and stay in front of one for an hour or two. But because of the way the wind tows in, you're, you're jibing off of nice headers, which is kind of a funny thing to do, but I'll show a diagram in a minute. The afternoon pop-up squalls, they don't last very long. They're only good for one pass. The wind tows out from in front of them, just like a cat's paw, and they're short-lived because they kill themselves due to the, the pool of cool air they generate underneath them. And you generally only see those in the afternoon. Um, avoid the area behind any squall. Um, the squalls always have light air behind them. And then the squalls, 
kind of move as if they're sailing deep on starboard pole. So they sort of sail along somewhat faster and deeper than a TP-52 on starboard. Um, and so port, getting away from the squall is much safer on port because the squall is kind of sailing along on starboard. It's moving with the upper level wind, which is why it's going to the right of the surface wind. Um, go to school on the first squall in a given night. Uh, this coming race, my guess is it's going to be kind of ENSO neutral or um, neutral in terms of the uh, El Nino. So I don't think it'll be super squally, but it should be a pretty typical year. Um, avoid squalls after dawn because as soon as the sun hits the, the highest clouds on a squall, the squall collapses. And then the whole area where the squall used to be turns into an area of light air. So, you, so just before dawn, you want to get into an area of... Um, of clear, so you, you got to get away from the squalls just before the sun comes up. Um, then halfway through the race, there's a convergent zone. It's a line of clouds. If you go through it at night, people will say it was a lefty squall, but it wasn't. It wasn't a squall. It's just this convergent zone, which has a less shift. Some years, it's a really big left shift, and sometimes you even have to change to a you know headsail to get through it. Um, some other years, you're delighted to get the southing, and off you go, you know, to the on that lefty. But there, but a lot of people will think it was a lefty squall, but in fact, it was the convergence zone. This is a pop-up squall. This is a drawing that Mike Deverge sent, um, but it's just it's just a downdraft. The thing goes up, and then it goes down. As soon as the squall starts to happen, and you get the downdraft, the cool air appears behind it and it kills itself. So this is the daytime, the late afternoon squall. And you play it just like a cat's paw and you avoid being behind it. This is a kind of a cross section of the nighttime squall, which is a dipole. It's got the updraft that's separated from the downdraft, which is why that can last for a long time. A more interesting view of it is from above. So the squall is moving to the right as if it was on starboard because it's moving with the upper level wind. It's moving at about the same speed as the surface wind. Um, and then you can see the way the wind tows in in front. And the reason it's towing in is because there's an updraft right about here. And so if you're on a boat that's the right speed, like a TP-52 or a sled, you can generally jive back and forth a few times. Um, and it's a good thing to do because then you're going to move across the ocean at about the same speed as the surface wind. And obviously you can't do that in those boats. They can't sail downwind as fast as the surface wind on a, you know, a sled or a TP-52. Um, so it's a good thing to do to jive back and forth, but you absolutely want to avoid the back of it. So you don't want to get too aggressive. And if the squall starts to overtake you, then, you know, it's safest to get away on port. The, um, Summary, and this gets to the question to Roy's question or the answer to Roy's question. The squalls move about 15 degrees to the right of the surface wind. That's due to the, um, the fact that the wind shifts left at the surface because of the friction. Um, and they move about as fast as the surface wind that is unaffected by the squall. And that's why a TP-52 or a sled that's in front of a squall in the accelerated breeze of the squall can move all about the same speed as the squall. Conventional sleds and TP-52s are about the right speed to jibe a few times in front of a squall. Slower boats, you know, if you're in a Cal 40 or something, um, you see a squall coming, you get onto port because overall there's going to be a right shift. You sail deep on port through the squall and then you stay on port to get out of that thing um, and to avoid the light air behind it. Um, faster boats, and this is Roy's question, you avoid the squalls. You just jive around them and overtake them. And it's okay to pass in front of a squall, but it's not worth the risk of the light air behind, given the very short time and the increased wind ahead. So if I've been navigating on Alfa Romeo or Comanche or something like that, you just basically, you just avoid the squalls. But if you have to pass in front of a squall, that's fine. Um, you might even gain a little bit, but you don't gain enough to be worth the trouble or to be worth the risk of, you know, somehow having, ending up behind the thing. But yeah, the squalls, you just go whizzing past them on a, on a maxi. 
um, cloud streets that don't look like this. They're not nearly as uniform as this drawing would indicate, but um, in the daytime, just after you've gotten out of the slot cars leg and you have kind of even jibes, port and starboard, it's a mistake to spend all day sailing under the clear sky because you'll see some, you know, clouds. Occasionally you'll see a real line of clouds like in this drawing, but mostly you'll just see patches of clouds. And so given that you've got, you know, even jibes, just get onto port, go over and get on the edge of some clouds and then sail along on the edge of the clouds rather than sailing along under the clear sky. But if you're on the edge of the clouds, you'll have about a knot more breeze. And then once you get back on starboard, you'll sort of stay with them because the clouds are moving, you know, as sort of as if they were on starboard jibe as well. So the, so it's not quite as uniform as this, but nevertheless, it's a mistake to sail all afternoon in the clear sky if you can you know, get over on port and get yourself on the edge of some clouds. And the interesting thing is, is that if you look off to port and you see clouds, they're gonna look like they're 20 miles away and like it's way too far to go. But there's an optical illusion. They're way closer than they seem. You'll um, jibe over onto port and then within 10 minutes, you'll be on the edge of the clouds and you can come back and then look at your wind gear and you'll notice you've got a knot more breeze and a tiny bit of a header. Um, look out the airplane window if you fly home and you'll see those patterns. On starboard, and this is generally true, but on starboard, you mostly stay in constant position relative to the clouds in the sky and on port, the clouds in the sky change very quickly. Um, there's more wind under the edge of the clouds, so just avoid the clear spots. And it's not a huge deal, but if you're sailing with a fleet of boats and you do a short jibe over and you get on the edge of the clouds, you'll notice that you'll slowly crush the other people. Final shift. The right corner generally pays most years because the wind continues to veer over the course of the whole race. So you'll be coming in on a you know, 70 degree magnetic wind. Um, the left corner pays if you're gonna beat a tropical inverted trough to the finish. And if there's gonna be a trough that's just behind you. And the reason for that is in front of a tropical trough, you have a left shift and it's accelerated breeze. So if there's a tropical trough and you're gonna beat it to Hawaii, you get down in front of it, then you got a really nice starboard jibe, you know, coming into the islands and you've got accelerated wind. Um, if on the other hand, if there's a tropical trough that's made it to the finish before you, then the right pays really big time because there's gonna be a right hand shift. It's gonna veer behind the tropical and it's gonna be light air to the south behind the tropical. So you wanna play that right-hand corner hard and then come in on port jibe. So you wanna keep your eyes on the tropical inverted troughs that are always moving along in the uh, trade winds. Um, don't overstand. I like to come in at Kalapapa. I'll describe why. It also provides some cheap air margin. If you, you know, aim for coming in on Kalapapa and you miss it a little bit, well, then you come into mid-channel and you can tell everybody that's what you wanted to do anyway. Um, so it's just a, it's a cheap way, a cheap insurance to come into Kalapapa, but there's also more breeze. Um, mind the happy hour lefty each evening when picking the ley line. Okay, so this is a couple of examples of the tropical. If you can see my cursor, here's a, a little inverted trough. Um, you don't even see it in the isobars, but you can see the kind of the veered accelerated breeze in front of it. And I'm sorry, the backed accelerated breeze in front of it. And you can see the veered light air behind it. And, um, you know, things in the tropics, they don't always have to be hurricanes. You just get these little tiny inverted troughs and it always has this effect of a backed increase in front of it and a veered light air behind it. So you just wanna keep an eye on that because that can affect which corner you wanna hit coming into the islands. Uh, here's another example. Um, this one is you know, much earlier, but again, you can see the, the backed increased breeze in front of it and the veered you know, lighter air behind it. The finish. Uh, the NAM, as I mentioned, is a great source of wind direction and speed approaching the islands. 
Um, it's good for ley lines. There aren't any relevant buoy reports and the land reports are too influenced by terrain to be all that useful. So the NAM is the best source for um, figuring out your ley lines and figuring out what you're gonna see, you know, going in through the channels. Jive to come into Kalapapa. Um, the coast of Molokai east of Kalapapa is risky. Um, it used to sometimes work in the Kenwood Cup, but I could never figure out how you knew. So I generally try to come in at Kalapapa. Sailing the accelerated breeze north of Molokai and west of Elio. Elio is on the um, western tip of Molokai. Uh, the Molokai ducting overcomes the divergence, but you'll still have light air if you get too close to Molokai. So what you want to sail is, you want to sail in the accelerated breeze north of Molokai, but you don't want to get into the beach there. Um, if you're on a slower boat that sails deeper VMG angles, sometimes like in a Cal 40, often you'll jive off of Kalapapa, jive onto starboard and it's one and in if it's breezy. And you go straight from Kalapapa all the way past Cocoa Head and straight to the finish. Um, the uh, Most boats that sail somewhat hotter angles or on lighter years, you will need to jive again to get to get down onto your ley line. And the best place to jive is just past Elio on the Molokai side, because there's the most breeze. So you go into Kalapapa, you jive, you jive to port again, just when you're beyond Elio, you pick your ley line from there and then off to Cocoa Head. Avoid the area near Makapu, it's lighter. Going close to Cocoa Head is fine because it's a convergent breeze. You can be about three quarters of a mile off. You get big heading puffs after Cocoa Head in windy northeast years, watch out for them. And interestingly, you can see them at night because there's enough light off the shore. Um, the picture in the lower right there, that's on our Cal 40, and that's in about a 35 knot gust right past Cocoa Head. And I think it was Skip Allen and John Andron driving and trimming, but it just, it astonished us that there was enough breeze so that it just blew the Cal 40 up onto a plane. And we're just planing along in this 35 knot gust after in that Cocoa Head Bay. Um, so watch for those. Um, and they generally don't last for very long. So even though you can't lay the finish when you're in one of those puffs, they generally go away and you'll be back up again. Um, in very light years, you have to do a few jibes along the coast of Oahu, but stay out of the bays and then navigate to the buoy. There will always be boats floating around in the vicinity of the finish, and their port side running lights will look like flashing red lights. The buoy is much, much brighter now than it used to be, so it's a lot easier to find. But always navigate to it. Don't try to you know, go to it by chasing every flashing red light you see. This is uh, Comanche. This is last race. There you can see Kalapapa just off their port bow. I was pretty happy with this approach. We had an interesting experience though, which is the jibe that we did a few minutes after this, Sharon took this photo, the canting system broke. And so we were able to get the keel to be fixed on center line, but we couldn't cant it to weather. So I had one jibe at Elio to figure out what the jibe angles were gonna be on this boat that I'd never sailed before, which is Comanche with a fixed keel. And then based on that one jibe from starboard to port off of Elio, I had to pick the ley line to go from Elio to Coco. So it was a really interesting situation. Um, here's a, this is a NAM file. This is the data that I'm suggesting you get to sort out your approach. But you can see this accelerated breeze north of Molokai. You don't wanna go in really close but there's good breeze all along here. And then there's breeze here just past Elio. So this is the area you want to do. You come into Kalapapa, you jibe to starboard, you jibe back, you sail in this accelerated breeze till you get to the ley line you want, and then you're off for Cocoa Head. This is the old school chart. These are an ISO tack chart. So the lines are of equal wind speed. Um, this is Kenwood era chart, but you can see the same conclusion. There's a, a maximum wind area here off of Molokai, and there's a maximum wind area here off of Elio. So in a old school boat that runs deep, you come in here to um, Kalapapa, and then on a Cal 40, you basically can lay it straight across. In a more modern boat that sails hotter angles, you come in here, 
You might jibe a time or two along here, but you don't play this beach really close. You're just playing the accelerated breeze here. And then you jibe in past Helio. You go through this max and then pick your pick your ley line to Cocoa Head. But you want to take you want to sail through all of that accelerated breeze. And it's very light up in here past Makapu. So you want to basically come in on starboard to Cocoa Head. So that's all I've got. Um, Dobbs, are there other questions we should address now? Uh, let's see. Did Sharon say that was one of the last photos I took before we had to do an emergency landing in Molokai? Yeah, Sharon had a big adventure in a helicopter with that one, Stan. Uh, yeah, we both did. So we broke our keel canning system and Sharon broke her helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, and I'll urge anyone who has any uh, last questions for Stan while we have them to uh, go ahead and type them into the chat window. Um, Stan, you're, you're not doing this race, which is uh, kind of remarkable, but um, are you going to miss yeah, it? I'm, oh, I will definitely miss it. I've got a very interesting project on the old team trimaran, Frank, uh, the Gitana, which is Frank Camasas and Charles Cadralier's um, trimaran. So I'll be over there working with them. So I'm looking cool. forward to uh, seeing what it's like on a flying hundred foot trimaran. They'll be doing the uh, fast net that I'll be sailing with them. And then later they'll be doing the transat jock varb that I'll be doing the shore routing for them. Oh, nice. Uh, Peter's asking what Comanche's jive angle was with the center line keel. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the funny thing was, is it felt like a perfectly reasonable boat. But it was just, you know, somewhat deeper angles and slower. I mean, that was the other difference. The boat was just, you know, less rocked up and, you know, it, so the angles were a little bit deeper and the boat was, um, you know, noticeably slower, but it, it felt like a perfectly normal boat sailing along. Excellent. Um, uh, so any other observations or, or uh, advice for our, uh, our crowd here? Enjoy your race. Is it, how about in the, in the big picture, Stan? Uh, you know, we, we talk about El Nino years and non-El Nino years. Where are we in that? Uh, um, my guess is it's going to be just right at neutral. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a few squalls and it'll be, I mean, as you all know, in a strong El Nino, you get lighter air and stronger squalls. And in a La Nina year, when it's colder, you get like it, you get more wind and less squalls. And I think this year is going to be pretty much neutral. Uh, having said all of that, and we all spend lots of time talking about, you know, El Nino. You know, having said that, I think the the variation week to week is actually greater than the variation the, that we see, you know, El Nino to La Nina. So. Um, so it's always the luck of the draw. And we see that because, you know, even boats finishing, you know, three days at a different time, you know, will have, you know, very much different breeze. So it's hard not to get, you know, all focused on El Nino and trying to figure out what we're going to get ahead of time. But um, there's enough variation week to week so that that tends to determine what kind of transpack you have. All right. Um... Let's see, a uh, question here from Doug Johnston. Uh, when talking about TP-52s, are you considering the newer gen boats versus the sleds or the older version TPs versus sleds in terms of relative boat speed? Um, I'm not sure how different they are, to be honest, but, but maybe you can comment. Yeah, it's not really that fine-tuned. Um, I was more thinking of the, you know, kind of the original generation, but the differences aren't aren't that huge. And, but basically I think that the takeaway is on a slow boat, you just have essentially one pass through a squall and try to get off on port to get away from it on a, there are certain boats in that sort of medium fast size range where it's often, you can do a few jibes. I mean, I think one race, I had a situation where we were able to stay with a squall for like three or four hours we probably did 15 jibes in a single squall, but it was just perfect. Meaning the boat we were on, in that case, it was a turbo sled. It was um, 
our speed in the accelerated breeze of the squall was just able to, to nearly keep us at the same speed of the squall so that we were very slowly losing. But then in a, in a maxi, um, you know, every now and then you kind of get it all lined up and you try to, um, you know, go th pass in front of a squall and you, but the gain is so short that you end up concluding that it's just not worth the risk and the hassle. So mostly you just stay away from them. Um, the other thing that's worth noting though, is that when you see a squall on the horizon, the first thing you do is make sure that the folks on deck, you know, grab the hockey puck and start taking bearings on the, on the squall. And then you wanna get calibrated as to where the oncoming lanes are for a squall. And if you're on um, starboard, Jibe, the oncoming lane is going to be like, you know, 10 or 15 degrees above, you know, your stern, above the center line of the stern on starboard. And then if you're on port, the oncoming lane is going to be about 20 degrees above the beam. And that varies as a function of what kind of boat you're on, the jibing angles, um, probably varies with the, you know, vertical profile of the wind. But in any event, it's a really helpful thing to know. So whenever the folks on deck see a squall, they should start taking bearings. And then there'll be a certain relative bearing to your boat where a squall is just gonna remain at the same bearing. Um, and that's sort of the oncoming lane. And it's different on starboard than it is on port because obviously the squall is sailing along as if it were on starboard. But it's a super helpful thing to know. And if you can get the crew on deck talking about it, to where they'll say, well, you know, tonight, you know, our, our lane is a little further forward than it was last night. It's just really helpful to know exactly how those squalls are moving so that you can either stay away from them or you can play them, you know, as appropriate, but you don't want to pass behind them. That's the most critical thing. All right, copy that. Uh, well, thank you, Stan. Uh, now, with the, uh, we're getting a lot of questions about where to find this. Oh, wait a minute. I got one other question. Uh, from Mark Svensson, do you like foiler configured boats like the Vendee Globe and, uh, and eventually allowed in a race such as Transpac would be feasible? Seems like that's a political question. <laughs> yeah, that's and it's certainly there's all kinds of opinions on that. But first, you know, it may be that the Transpac would want to put them in a separate class or, you know, start them out in a wingnut division. But it's always hard to race you know, very different boats against one another. It'd be kind of like trying to race multi-hulls against monohulls. So that's, that'll be a challenge, but it is part of our future. And I think boats like Comanche, you know, will become a dinosaur. And, you know, I've set probably 15 world records on Comanche, but they're all in flat water because, you know, Comanche doesn't like big sea state and all of those records will get taken away by a open 60 with a T rudder. Um, and then, and then later foilers that are, you know, kind of the new architecture, like the, uh, the cup boats that people start to build offshore versions of those. So I think all of the world records are going to, are going to tumble as people start to come with foilers and the foilers like flat water, but so does all the other boats that currently hold the record. So I think they'll all be in play. Right. Well, yeah, we'll certainly look forward to having seen some of those in the Pacific. Um, one last question from Peter Eisler. Stan, do you mean the navigator has to come up on deck and look at the sky? <laughs> <laughs> Always, yeah, I try to get, I mean, I'll be on deck, you know, every, every few hours um, to brief the crew. And I'll always, you know, make sure to brief the crew on what they can expect over the next few hours. I'll make sure they know, what the um, you know free advance course is, meaning where would we move the boat if we could go in any direction, which generally isn't where you're pointed. It's generally you know either the direction of due downwind day after tomorrow or whatever. But it, and uh, you know Peter would appreciate how I'm gonna the next sentence, which is the free advance course is almost always perpendicular to your reverse isochrons you know, from the finish. But it's really important for the folks on deck to know that because if you get a squall, you get a sudden wind change and you can go anywhere that's helpful for the crew to know exactly what course it ought to be. So every few hours, I'll brief the folks on deck on what they can expect in the short term, on what the free advance course is, and then I'll look at the sky. And then I'm always on deck before dawn, just to make damn sure that the boat's in the clear sky region and we're not running the risk of being anywhere near a squall when the sun first hits the top clouds of the squall 
because, um, you know, as some of the folks on here in the chat will remember with me that we've just had some epic tragedies in Transpax where we got too close to a squall at dawn and were becalmed and had the you know, sled fleet sail around both sides of us. So I never make that mistake again. Um, so yeah, I'm on deck a lot. Um, you know, I don't steer as much as, you know, Peter did who asked the question, you know, I'll occasionally have a go, but I'm on deck every few hours to look at the sky. Right, copy that, thanks. Um, all right, well, um, I, I, I think this was excellent. Thank you, Stan. Uh, and the, this, this um, Zoom call was recorded, this portion of our presentation, and, and it will be posted in a couple of, uh, Tom says, within uh, 48 hours or so uh, on the Transpac website. But uh, Stan, will you make this PowerPoint available on your site, uh, HoneyMath? Yeah, I'll post, I'll post, post the um, PowerPoint on my site, uh, replace the old one. And then if people want to see you know, the slide with the um, animation of the eddy, that would be a good place to see it. And it, the nice thing about seeing it there is you can scroll backwards and forwards in time by grabbing the PowerPoint pointer. And then I might point some other, I might also post some other um, overlays there as well. Put the link to that um, on the Transpac site along with the recording so you can go right to Stan's site and see that. Cool. Okay. Great. Well, great. Stan, thank you so much for your generosity of time and sharing your knowledge so uh, unselfishly. And uh, we appreciate it very, very much. I also would note if anybody noticed that you sort of navigated your talk to end at precisely the right time. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> so, uh, again, we can't thank you enough um, and appreciate your participation. Um, next.